a button and it means that we're super official like. Um, hi. Hi. How is everybody? Good? Uh, yeah, I'm Adam and uh, this talk's called Can We Figure Out This Drupal Component Thing Already? I don't know, I've rephrased that like 70 times because it's kind of long. Uh, but that's what I'm landing on right now. Uh, this talk is a bit of an exploration into some of the innovative things we've done in the community and trying to move away from being in this exploratory space into something that's a little bit more firm, some best practices are defined. So I'm Nerdstein. That's what I go by. I am the VP of engineering here uh, or at Hook42. Uh, Component-based design has always been something that I have been very interested in and really it stemmed from several like really horrible projects uh, that I worked on and you know you've got this like mix of design people doing creative work and technology people and it's like you know two different complete worlds that just don't even work well together like it's just pretty crazy so that's kind of what motivated me to look into all of this. Uh, but thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. All right, so I want to start, and I'm glad Tim's here. So my opinion, all right, I believe that Philadelphia is pretty much kind of like, like the epicenter of Drupal. I just, I believe that. And it personally reflects my Drupal roots. Drupal Delphia 2012. 2012, dating myself, was the first Drupal camp that I ever attended when I worked at Penn State. Earl Miles was the keynote. You remember that? I met Tim Plunkett. I met Zen Doodles, Miss Andrea, for the first time. ZivTech just opened a new office, had an awesome party that night, had a really good time. And I knew at that point that this was a community that I wanted to be a part of. I had, I had a blast. People were great. The talks were good. So again, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Here's a brief outline of the talk today. We're going to do a little introduction, kind of the space, what I've done, some background, the whole works. We're going to review some key concepts. That's when we're starting to get into some of the best practices. I'll talk about some implementation ideas and then emerging technologies. All right, so an introduction. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. Steve Jobs, no longer with us. So innovation really is the key for Drupal to remain vibrant as a tool, as a project, that people use. I think it's very, very much true. I think we pride ourselves as a community in solving extremely difficult and hard problems. And we have a community of amazing, very talented people that can solve those problems. It's a good fit, right? And, you know, really when Drupal 8 started coming out, when it was being developed, we really began spreading our wings into other projects as well. And it's not now just a Drupal thing. We're touching other open source projects and a whole ecosystem of things that we never imagined before. The entire space of Drupal and components has been an area of exploration very recently in the last year, year and a half, two years. Many companies in the space have different contributed solutions with certain differences, you know, some more significant than others. Uh, but for me personally, I care a little bit more about the discipline behind it and the ideas uh, and trying to understand the different approaches than I do really the marketing aspects of it or like a product. I don't really care about that. Um, some people do care about things like the time to market and getting stuff out there with their name attached to it or promoting a specific approach. I don't really care. I just want to be clear on that. So I want to ta uh, take a step back. And instead of focusing on, hey, there's this amazing product that does this thing over here, I want to really understand how we've gotten to this point, what we understand to date, what we've learned, and where we might be going in the future. You know, some projections, but could be wrong, who knows. 
I do, I will say, I believe it is time that we begin to define some of the best practices that we need to use. Uh, I think it's, it's long past due. I'll just say that. As I noted uh, a few minutes ago, we really are at the cross of two extremely different disciplines with this kind of idea. Uh, we have like the design related discipline that is, you know, highly creative, uh, you know, trying to produce great things for users, usability, all of that, right? And, and produces creative artifacts. Uh, but it's been a long-standing problem that delivering that to an implementation team, to a technology team, is really very, very hard. Oftentimes, the requirements are very hard to communicate. Uh, technologists want good specifications. Sometimes that stuff doesn't happen. Uh, and really, like, let's face it, because we're humans, they're just two different brains. It's like you know, your creative brain is a lot different than your analytical brain. So it's, it's not a good mix. Uh, so how do we try to begin to look at these problems and solve them? Well, first, we have design systems. Design systems have been coming out uh, recently. One system that, uh, that I'll be presenting on in this talk is Pattern Lab uh, that have helped to try to solve the problem of defining good design specifications. Uh, Pattern Lab is based on a book called Atomic Design, and Atomic Design is really a related set of principles that help to promote a set of patterns and reusability of those patterns. And that exists really at the end goal to help designers produce really good high fidelity prototypes of their creative work. Um, the great thing about it is the result of it is that now we have more clarity in the specifications and that's a better handoff to a technology team, to an implementation team who's building something on top of you know, the creative designs, AKA a Drupal website, yay. But why stop there, right? Design systems, which I might go back and forth and say pattern libraries, if you hear either one, I'm talking about this exact same thing, are basically producing technical artifacts. Wouldn't you agree? They're prototypes. You don't have to stop there, you can actually Re, you know, release that code and reuse it inside of the technical system as well, right? You don't have to reinvent it or redevelop it. So that's really where the approach is now of integrating these two tools have started, and this is where we are. Um, reusing these design artifacts is, is actually a, can be a hard problem, um, believe it or not. Uh, but if you do it thoughtfully, it can really reduce the burden on the implementation that you're working on. So I want to talk about just some brief examples in the wild of names and things you probably might have heard about if you were looking into any of this before. And this represents some of like the innovation and the exploration that the community has already tried to do. Uh, there's like a Pattern Lab Drupal starter kit uh, that's written for Pattern Lab itself. Uh, there's the Emulsify Drupal theme. Uh, the, there was a really early one called Shyla uh, Drupal theme that kind of started exploring this space very early on. This was, I think, almost two and a half years ago now. Um, and then there's several other things uh, that, that are out there. If you Google, you, you will find a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, again, some of these things are Drupal themes. Some of them are Pattern Lab foundations that have some specific Drupal integration tied to them or some configuration that's Drupal friendly. Um, but I think um, there's also a lot of innovation happening too in the contrib space. I'll get to that later if you've ever heard of UI patterns or something like that. We'll talk about that momentarily. But all of these things kind of have limiting mileage, right? I think it's key to understand that. So some limitations really uh, include mostly around the coupling with Drupal. Um, especially within these themes, if you look at a Drupal theme, you're embedding that directly inside of the Drupal code base. What happens if you ever want to use that pattern library outside of Drupal? Hmm, that's interesting. What happens if you want to use it on a secondary Drupal site? Hmm, that's interesting too. Well, I, I'll just copy the code. Well, then what happens if you need to maintain it? Hmm, 
Mm, that seems problematic. Mm. I would also say a lot of the solutions are really promoting some bias of some sort, right? They may pick a set of technologies or a set of practices that are comfortable for a certain team. Maybe they're using SAS or less, or they've selected Gulp or Grunt or some set of technologies that people have said, ah, this is what it is and deal with it. And I would say probably the number one issue that I actually have with most of these solutions is the documentation. I've not found the documentation explaining why these tools exist and how uh, they've developed it in a certain way and what their motivations were behind it and how to extend it for my own use cases. Uh, so those are really, to me, some of the big um, things that I've found problematic with some of the existing contributed tools. Um, the basics of all of this is the more coupling that you have really inside of Drupal and everything like that, it really limits the amount of freedom you have to build your Drupal site the way that you want to build it. Uh, it has varying mileage. And I think having that freedom is actually what makes Drupal really strong. You can build whatever you want, right? It's extremely extensible. So I really wanted to kind of remove any sort of bias. I didn't want to get locked into any technology. Um, I really want to understand kind of what the problems were. And I didn't want to have to have any regrets later that I had some baggage or technical debt along with me. That led me uh, to write my first blog post on this topic called Exploring Simplicity in Drupal Design Components. And that's on nerdstein.net. This was written back in October of 2017. Uh, I was at MidCamp in 2017, uh, and I saw a talk by a friend of mine named Brian Perry. Some of you might know him. Uh, we had a really big, big debate uh, while we were there about different component-related ideas and different solutions about components. And he and I actually had a bunch of different kind of beliefs. Like they were, you know, it was it was kind of interesting. But it really piqued my curiosity even further. So I wanted to take a step back, like I said, and define and understand the problems that were in the space, uh, how a different design team would work with an integration team, and how that should go together, and what the different problems were. Um, and and I, I will just admit freely that when I was writing this blog post, I kept thinking to myself, like, oh, I'm really sure that Emulsify is solving this problem already. Or I'm really sure that the pa uh, Drupal Pattern Lab starter kit is solving this problem already. But again, I wanted to back up and try to say, all right, what's the goal? What are we trying to achieve? And I really wanted to make sure I was exploring independent solutions to these problems because to me, I don't, you know, don't care. Um, so I had an opportunity to do this. My blog post was written based on a new Drupal 8 website that I'm building for my blog, <laughs> believe it or not. And I, you know, just like a design team would do, I got this raw prototype in HTML with some CSS. And I decided, hey, why not explore this and throw that into a, a design system and start hacking at it? So I want to share the problems that I ran into as part of this exercise. The first is I was very adamant that I wanted to make sure the solution was fully decoupled, right? Because if anybody else wanted, for God unknown, unknown reasons, to use my pattern lab as the basis for their website, they could do it. You know, it wouldn't be limiting, right? But if you were, I was trying to mimic what a real enterprise project would look like if you have, say, one design library and 800 websites that you maintain using the same design library. So that's what I was kind of going after. Uh, I really wanted a fully decoupled approach without that coupling. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that in any way, shape, or form, I could make this as friendly as possible towards other CMS systems. If I ever wanted to go down the road and switch to WordPress, or if I even wanted to do a static site generator or some sort of other technology that I wanted to play around with down the road, I wanted to make sure I wasn't limiting myself as much as I possibly could. 
Uh, and again, I just want to reiterate that like I, I was pretty much mimicking what I thought an enterprise would try to do because you know someday having that type of work as I've already experienced would be something that I know I would have to encounter and I wanted to use it as a good learning opportunity. Um, and the main key the key thing here for you know real enterprise builds is reusability, scalability, portability. Those are the big factors that I was trying to make sure that I was respecting. Another major problem is having or establishing some sort of a shared technology baseline between the design system and the content management system. Uh, the design teams and the tech teams need to have some shared understanding on a baseline of tools. And it doesn't need to be every single tool. Um, it, it can be whatever really works for the teams. But if you're integrating the two systems, there is a baseline. Like Twig is almost a baseline that has to be there, right? Uh, and there can be more. Uh, maybe you want to use a CSS framework like um, Bootstrap, or you want to settle on CSS Grid, right? There's different choices and things that need to be made for this uh, technology baseline. It could even be, go down to like a front-end framework like React or Angular or Vue, uh, any of those. Um, I will say that in my experience, um, tools like SAS or LESS are not necessary in this, but they can belong to a certain system. Like if you have a design system that's using SAS or less, that can belong to that. Uh, there's other ways that you can produce out, uh, artifacts and outputs that don't need to be biased between both systems. So there are some things that don't have to be shared. Which gets me to my next point about <laughs> one of the other major problems is packaging and delivering assets from the design system into the content management system. So to reuse anything, you need to make sure that you can, the CMS or the, the tool that you're uh, building can consume it, consume assets that are produced from the design system. And this could include packaging assets uh, because I actually found that to be a really easy way to move things from one system to the other if they were packaged together. Um, the way that patterns work uh, is that you may have, say, you know, one CSS file per pattern. It's a lot harder to ship assets when there's, there's you know, hundreds of patterns and hundreds of CSS files. If you aggregate that together with you know, Gulp or Grunt using some, some cool front end tools uh, in Node or Ruby or anything like that, you can, it's kind of elegant to uh, package it all together and then move one file over when you aggregate. Uh, and that really only impacts the design system as you're producing a release and producing a package. Depending on your content management system though, uh, the markup might not need to be packaged. It might be able to be referenced uh, through the pattern. So uh, Drupal 8 itself has Twig as the templating system for markup. Um, the the Drupal themes actually have, and I'll talk about this later, have the ability to reference those Twig files directly that are pulled from uh, from a design system, so that you don't have to worry about the same packaging and aggregation uh, stuff. So, uh, one thing though, I will just state for the record that it can be limiting if you pick, you know, something like Twig, and you have another CMS that's using something else. So you might actually be able to convert that stuff using Gulp or Grunt take all your twig files and convert it to another format like handlebars or something else. So that's another consideration. I haven't explored it yet, but that might be one use case you run into. Uh, but subsequently, the, the delivery and the packaging of the design system needs to be available for the CMS to consume. That's a critical problem that needs to be solved with your implementation. And then after delivery, um, the content management system needs to be able to integrate these assets inside of its implementation, right? You actually have to build the glue and the wiring that, that makes all of this happen. Uh, and as a fully decoupled system, this implementation inside of the CMS probably has the most degrees of freedom here. Like there's probably a thousand ways to do this and having some set of understanding of best practices is, is really key in my mind. Um, and it's just exactly like Drupal itself, right? When you have a tool like Drupal, it has a great framework, thousands of contributed modules, right? A good community. You can do a lot of crazy things 
<laughs> you know, that's what separates a good Drupal implementation from one that might, you know, not be so great. Um, so it's the same exact idea with this integration. Uh, you can do it great, or you might not hit the mark. So I'll share some thoughts later on some best practices for that integration in, I think, the second to last uh, section. So another really critical problem here is actually change management. You do the initial integration, that's great, right? But what happens if someone rolls in new changes to the design system? Ooh, right? I have to make it work again. Well, there are best practices on how to do that. Because these are two different systems, this has the same classical problem of, of every other third-party dependency that Drupal has to deal with, right? So just bear in mind that that's, that's a big part of this uh, if you want it to be sustainable. Uh, one system can and should really be able to evolve independently from the other, but you should have a, a very clear process, a well-defined process for bringing in code from the design system making the changes needed for the CMS system uh, and doing it thoughtfully. You should have that defined. And I'll talk about some ideas on that later. Cool. So far, are you with me? Okay. So after I wrote that blog post, the community was pretty much silent. I, I didn't hear a word, right? Went into the ether in the you know electronic Twitter space with nothing, okay? And that's fine. Um, I didn't. I didn't get any. I'm sorry. You were ahead of your time. Ahead of my time, I, apparently, or no one read it. One of the two. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I received very little feedback and didn't get much engagement. But Brian and I continued to talk throughout the year, and you know, stuff was changing in the Drupal community. These tools were maturing a little bit more. More people were doing this. More people were writing about it, sharing their thoughts. You know, still very exploratory, very um, innovative uh, in nature. Um, but we were seeing more, you know, programming approaches, more site building approaches coming up in the Drupal space. Fast forward to mid camp this last year, uh, which was a little bit before DrupalCon, I believe. Um, Brian and I again, you know, hanging out at mid camp. We're sitting in the sprint room uh, for the first day. Uh, he just got there, I just got there, and uh, the organizers actually had a cancellation. And they came over and they asked Brian, hey, would like the two of you want to do a panel uh, on component-based design? And I'm like, oh, that's funny. You know, I like, I don't really feel like I have any street cred. Why would you ask me to, to give a talk on components? And the organizer said, oh, it's hilarious. We, we use the Nerdstein method all the time in the work that we do. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? Uh, kind of caught me off guard. I was laughing, and I thought he was joking, and, and he wasn't. Uh, so they had read my old blog post. They appreciated it, and, and they asked for Brian and I to, to do this really impromptu, very uh, informal uh, presentation. It was actually hilarious. It was probably one of the, the best talks I've ever given, just in terms of how much fun I had. Uh, Brian moon, moonlights as an improv comedian. You could imagine giving him a stage and letting him do his thing. It was pretty entertaining. And I guess I just like pain and suffering. So, you know, it was a good fit, right? Uh, but it was, it was a blast. Um, one of the key things that came out of that talk is exactly what we're talking about today, which is as a community, we still have not figured out <laughs> what this thing really needs to be. What are the best practices? How do we do this the right way? What, um, everything like that. It's, it's still very, very not well defined. So the rest of this talk is dedicated to sharing key concepts and implementation ideas in the effort of helping to move some of that forward. Here we go. You're seeing a trend here. I wrote a second blog post. Achieving clarity in component-based best practices. Huh. I will just state for the record that like anything else, the following points that I raise are really just ideas of what you should strive to do. They're not going to be perfect. They're not going to be for everyone's use cases. But it's really intended to start this conversation. Let's get this going. 
there will be many more conversations like this that happen into the future. Some of my ideas might be right, some of them might be wrong, but they're ideas. In practice, you might actually have situations or circumstances that force you to deviate from stuff that I put in here. That's fine. We need to start somewhere. So let's begin by looking into some of these key concepts. This is going to very much feel like an academic lecture. I apologize. I wish I had more memes in this talk. Put it together late last night. But we'll deal with it. I used to teach at Penn State. Yeah. All right. Normalization and the bridge between atomic design. All right, so as technologists, I think we, uh, if you've taken any sort of computer science course at all, you should understand what the word normalization means. It's basically related to databases, right? And you have fields and you have tables and foreign keys and you split these things out into the smallest atomic form that you possibly can and then you reuse tables and rows and you join them together through keys and all this other stuff. There are parallels to what we have in Drupal today with the same idea. We have entities, we have fields, and we have entity references that bridge these things together. A classic example being, oh, I want a user to show up on my content type, so I'm just going to select the user instead of putting every user field inside of that form, right? That's the same idea. So when we look at patterns inside of this design system, I have news. They operate in the exact same way. Precisely the same idea. We're just using different phrasing today. One of the principles of atomic design is to make the smallest possible pattern you can and reuse it as needed. It's the same same thing as normalization. So this atomic design principle promotes these really small patterns. They call them atoms. You can see the chart over here, A-T-O-M, not A-D-A-M. That's my name. Um, and those atoms roll into molecules, or they can roll into organisms. And really, by the end of the day, you end up getting to the highest order pattern, which is a page. And a page is really a combination of several patterns that come together in an expected use case, right? By the way, normalization can be almost viewed in the same way as what we now call, in this space, the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself, D-R-Y. So that's one of the principles in this space, very, very much related to some other ideas that us technologists already understand. The next concept or ideal that I want to discuss is the KISS concept. And this is, again, you know, probably still familiar to some of you. Uh, but design systems, in my mind, they're intended to represent an ideal, right? They're supposed to be this, this nice, pristine, m prototype and perfect-looking design of what it is that you need to do. That's its purpose, first and foremost. But as it continues to get easier to reuse these assets in other systems, it's actually increasing the burden on that system to be the source of truth for how your site looks and feels, right? So it's actually adding more to that ideal than what originally it was intended probably to do, to be honest. So when I look at design systems, I think it is of the utmost importance to apply the KISS concept. KISS being keep it simple, stupid, right? Because you have to work with people like me. If I want to look at the code, I want to see something simple because maybe I'm just not that great of an engineer. So it is a great way to look at your motivation of when you're implementing your design system, how you're producing the code. It needs to be really simple. Very simple and straightforward. The patterns should be simple. The processing inside of the twig should be simple. The data models themselves should be simple, right? We'll see some examples of that here soon. The processing itself, uh, the data process, processing to be specific, inside of a pattern should always be minimized as much as you possibly can. There's a good reason for it. You can have processing for things that are consistent. So say you have conditional logic, like I want to show an image or I don't want to show an image, right? That happens all the time. That's good processing. 
But if you find yourself writing processors inside of Twig to transform data, that's probably where I would say this, things start to get really mucky. The data transformation, um, I can explain a little bit more uh, detailed later, but you should always be basing things off of something that's ideal, and you shouldn't need to transform it, right? If you have an example of this system is expecting data in this form, why would you transform it further? Something tells me that's a miss, right? It's definitely not representing the KISS concept. So here's an example of something that I think is actually pretty straightforward, right? Um, here's a list of social media icons inside of a pattern. Here's a data that represent it. Look, there is no processing. It is strings, it is links, it is paths, right? There's nothing fancy in there. Does it make sense? The twig that goes with that inside of the design system represents the same simplicity, right? Here's a, a loop. Pass it the name, pass it the message, the image, and there we go. That's it. Not a lot of stuff, right? Just renders the fields. Cool. The next principle I want to discuss is the least responsibility principle. And this is really the one I think that gets a little hairy. Um, it's my view uh, that, you know, as I've stated, that the design system owns the ideal model, right? It owns the, the perfect, the pristine view. In my opinion, it is the CMS's responsibility to conforming to that ideal view, right? If you're doing an implementation, CMS has to make sure that it is doing what it needs to do to represent the ideal. So I believe it owns the responsibility for this integration. It's on the CMS. So if the CMS system owns all the processing, regardless of the architecture, you should see things like transformations and mappings to the expected pattern that it pulls in from the design system. I think there's a good kind of parallel to migration work in the Drupal community. Anybody touch the Migrate API? Kind of the same paradigm here, right? Because one of the main things, one of the main takeaways here is that this processing has to be specific for every single CMS that you're integrating with. So every CMS will have its own data structures, its own processing, its own data transformations. It needs to own that. The more that you push that into the design system, the, the more fragile the implementation is, right? Because CMS specific code in a design system is not ideal, it's not generic, right? Every CMS should own that. Does that make sense? So here's an example, probably not a great one because I'm not doing any transformation, but this is basically a mapping of a Drupal related data structure in Twig to a Pattern Lab sponsored pattern. And that's it. It's mapping the two attributes between, you know, the source and the destination or whatever. Okay? Another really key thing in my mind is actually understanding pattern variations. So there's a really powerful feature, okay, inside of Pattern Lab called a variation. And a variation in its raw form or what people generally understand it as is different content changes, right? So oh, here's one title that I expect, or here's another title that I expect. But we can take that a lot farther than what people think on the surface. The same pattern can represent the same you know, structure of data in terms of content, but it also can represent different configurations. Hmm, right? So we have metadata in Drupal, right? Like the pages, the meta tags, all that other stuff. The same idea can apply here. So the data that we can pass to a pattern doesn't just have to be content, doesn't have to be a new, another title or a different body text. It might be something like, okay, I want a red background or a blue background. And then it changes, right? It could be a CSS class. It could be triggering an image render or a not image render, right? So this configuration, um, is really critical 
in my mind, to reusing patterns. We have to understand that we can have variations that are not just changes in text, for lack of a better term. Right? And you can see kind of the, the idea here with these dresses, right? They're very, very similar in nature, but we're just switching one thing about them, right? Everything else is the same. Um, the variations themselves, if you use them thoughtfully, they can actually reduce the number of patterns that are in your design library, and they more accurately promote reuse. So you're, you're doing yourself a solid, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so in this case, uh, Brian actually gave me some really cool code that shows um, some standards. We're going to get into some standards shortly. It uh, looks like I swapped the wrong slides here. But you can see that we're actually using different standards inside of the twig. And I, that's a big point that I wanted to raise as part of this talk, is you should always be observing any standards that you can. The standards inside of uh, the pattern library and in Drupal and the implementation are things like the atomic design standards, BEM standards, uh, SMACs, and then all the framework standards of things that you do. So like if you have Drupal, you want to observe its framework, best practices, CSS, JS, all that, right? React. Make sure that you're respecting that. So in this case, you can actually see that we have some code examples that are using the proper class names that show and reflect those standards. Following that makes it incredibly easier to, to use. And here's the SCSS file, the twig file, and uh, two, two uh, different models of that, right? This, I think, is actually a molecule, just passing a different configuration. Then gets to the slide that I was expecting before that, which is adhering to standards. We already covered it. You should be making sure that you're doing work in a consistent and predictable way. You do not want to be doing things in a way that someone picks it up and goes, oh my god, wow, this person has no idea what they're doing, right? And we just went through a recent, you know, series of security updates, right, for in the Drupal community. There's a good reason to use standards, right? If someone has to go in and clean up your crap, you should probably be doing things in a way that they would expect to see it. It saves time. It's more predictable. Everyone's expecting it. Just do it. <laughs> All right. Section number three, implementation ideas. So let's get to the, the real technical bits here, get out of so, some of the concepts and move into some real stuff. All right. Packaging, releasing, and change management. We talked about it earlier. It's a critical thing that we need to make sure is working thoughtfully. Um, I will start by saying that the design system needs to be stored inside of a code repository. You should have good a log of commits, you should have branches, you should do all of that stuff that comes with the code repository. Uh, releases especially. If you have releases of your design system, that affords and opens up an entirely new realm of possibilities for doing deployments and, and packaging uh, and between these two systems. Uh, it basically enables you to have deployable builds. Every pattern, as we talked about before, is going to have its own CSS and JS, right? You can manually import every single one of those between the two systems, but that's really tedious, right? If you have a whole changing system and you have seven new patterns come in, you would need to map seven new files you know, from the, those patterns into your CMS system. That's pretty cumbersome. So again, I, and I talked about this before, you can use Gulp or Grunt to kind of uh, aggregate those things, package it into one CSS file that makes it really easy to reference that inside of a Drupal theme, and it's one and done, and you don't need to maintain it moving forward. It's actually a lot more elegant. Drupal 8 uh, has a lot of good composer integration. Drupal 7 has some uh, kind of sketchy, a little bit, not really. Um, but Drupal 8 especially, uh, we have some opportunities to leverage composer here to do this integration as well. Uh, so you can pin, uh, you can add the code repo for the design system inside of your composer file. And that gives you the ability to also pin a specific release. So there's your change management piece, right? You basically then update your release when you're ready. You do the remedial work to fix your Drupal site and do a new release of the Drupal site at your convenience, right? Uh, the 
the integration at that point actually leverages Drupal's caching system because same with everything else inside of the vendor directory of Composer, right? It all works. It's actually easy. Um, and so all you need to do is basically put in a few lines in your theme info file and the libraries file just to reference the right CSS and the right JavaScript. Dunzo. Uh, we'll talk about the Twig files just in a little bit uh, when we get into some of the contributed sections. Uh, but really what that allows you to do is have a nice gradual approach for doing your change management and things won't break. Works. All right, so this was in uh, Benjamin's talk earlier and I apologize. I did not know you were going to put this image on your talk. Um, earlier we uh, discussed Drupal's extensibility and the flexibility that a system affords, especially with its degrees of freedom, right? Um, it can be implemented in a million and one different ways and that often usually means that people are looking like this. It's like, oh my god, I implemented this really poorly and now I'm paying for it. I should have known better. I didn't learn this part of the system, whatever, whatever it is, right? It, it's the exact same idea with the design system. With great power comes great responsibility, right? It's always the case. So implementation decisions should be made thoughtfully. I, I want to really stress that there are so many different approaches that you can use. I'll get into a lot of them here, actually, um, that you can consider. You know, it, it could be, you know, how you structure your data, how you build your editing experience. All of these factors play into this integration, right? So there's so many different things. You should discuss them. You should debate them. You should settle on something. But I, the point that I want you to understand from this talk is you should always produce the best and the most incredible Drupal architecture that you possibly can for your clients. Integrating it with a design system will come. You can do it. You can work with practically any architecture. So if you build the right thing in Drupal, that is your first <laughs> goal. You can make this work. So how do we look at implementing these patterns inside of the CMS itself? There's a couple ideas that I think are really, really, really critical. A popular misconception that I heard repeatedly at MidCamp was around this one-to-one -one mapping idea. If I produce a pattern in my design system, that is a one-to-one -one thing of what needs to be in the Drupal system wrong. That is 100% false. It completely violates the, the dry principles. Totally. A great example of that is actually pages inside of the design system. Pages are not supposed to be imported to Drupal at all. They're purely mock-ups of expected uses of patterns inside of the design system. Pages are 100% composite. They don't have any new stuff that they're building. They are just like, here's nine different patterns on a page. Oh, and here's another page with 10 different patterns. It shows you a visual model of what you're expected to use. Those page patterns never get imported into Drupal. Never, ever, ever, right? The patterns that exist on that page are what gets imported into Drupal for your specific use cases. It's the composite pieces. You know, and another, another way to look at this, right, is you could have the same pattern that could be used inside of a Drupal view you could have the same pattern that could be used inside of a custom block type. You could have the same pattern that could be used by a view mode. It's all reusing the same thing. If it's using the same pattern, use the same pattern. You don't have to produce different patterns to correspond to your CMS architecture. You don't need to do it. Reuse if you have it, right? You have the flexibility, the complete discretion to map and create whatever you want as part of this integration. It's up to you. And if you're observing atomic design principles, you likely, you know, will be mapping several patterns inside of the Drupal construct anyways, right? It's not going to be one-to-one. -one. So the page template is a, is a perfect, perfect example, right? The page template's a thing that sponsors the header and the footer, right? You can have nine or ten different patterns inside of that one template alone. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So you're not constrained at all about how you integrate the patterns, what patterns have to live where. Do what makes sense for your implementation. All right, so let's talk about some of these tools. Uh, I think Tim's ears are starting to burn over here. So um, we have what I would call must-use co-sponsored tools, okay? I will say, just for the record, that my bias lives in using core. Core doesn't go away, right? 
contrib solutions come and go, uh, maintainers come and go of those solutions, but Core is, is probably the most stable or most consistent thing that we have. I always advocate for using Core first and foremost. So what would you do inside of a component-based integration that could use Core? First and foremost, custom block types. In Drupal 8, the block system was rewritten. You have fieldable block types now in Drupal. Those can represent reusable blocks that can be placed anywhere on a page, conditionally, you name it, um, inside of Drupal, out of the box, 100%. Use it. It will save tons of time. Layout Builder. So this is the big one. The new stuff that's coming, uh, very recent updates in Core, have made massive improvements to the Layout UI, the Layout Builder, and the Layout capabilities inside of Core itself. This is probably the most cutting edge. Uh, Tim's working on it now, <laughs> literally. Um, and it's, but it's taking off. Um, what would that replace? Well, it could replace something like panels on your site, and it comes fully in core. So you know it's going to work well with custom block types. You know it's going to work well with views. You know it's going to work well with content types. Every part of Drupal that's in core, it's going to work pretty decently with, right? There might be bugs, but hey. Okay. Other core sponsor tools that you should definitely look into, views, right? Because you could produce dynamic data, use views templates, map that into a pattern, bring in your you know, design system patterns, and boom, there you go. You have views integration with your pattern lab. Content types, view modes. View modes, I think, is underrated, in my mind, um, where you can have the same data structure that has different presentations, and that can map to one or more patterns. That's super trivial, right? You don't have to reproduce you know, build like nine different content types that have the same exact structure, right? You don't have to do it. So those are good ideas, I think, for you to consider when looking at doing this component-based design philosophy inside of Core. What would I classify as must-use contributed modules? First and foremost, the components module. That is how you do the mapping from the design system twig to the Drupal twig files. It is a must. I wrote a very small module, it's three lines, it's called block type templates. If you create a new custom block type, that exposes a theme suggestion that you can write a twig file per block type that exposes it and gives you the ability to embed the same markup or pattern for a block type. What would I classify as optional contributed modules? This is not popular opinion, but paragraphs is unquestionably optional. Why might someone use it? Well, they love Drupal 7. Drupal 7, paragraph solves a very legitimate problem. In Drupal 8, no. The block system can handle 98, if not 99% of the use cases that you would want to do with paragraphs. In my, in my opinion, it's all preference at that point, right? Oh, I had this on my 7 site, I'm going to bring it over to my 8 site. I know the Paragraphs uh, has a wide, huge ecosystem of different modules and tools and, and blog posts and everything like that. It's my opinion, but you don't need it. Uh, UI patterns. So this is a really uh, cool kind of component module inside of Drupal. Uh, the the whole target audience for the UI patterns module, in my opinion, is a site builder. It moves a lot of the component-based integration into site building inside of the Drupal system. So you create a set of patterns, they map to things that are in your design system, and then you can say, you know, select that from how you render a view. Or you can select that about how you render a content type or a view mode. So UI Patterns allows that to be done within the configuration of the Drupal implementation, not programmatically like I have been discussing so far. So that's a pretty fun one, but it is optional. So if you have a team of people that would prefer site building, that might be a good one for you to look into. I know Brian likes this one. Uh, and Display Suite, that's another one that you know, has some extra bells and whistles that you could turn on, mostly integrated with panels at this point, right? I think it does have some layout functionality of this now maybe or should soon yeah yep he's nodding that's good um, didn't want to misspeak so uh, yeah so that's another one you might need conditionally but uh, it's optional 
Last section is emerging technology. So I wanted to just think about, like, okay, what does this space look like in two to three years? I want to start by discussing Gutenberg. And I haven't shied away from anything that I have felt would be an unpopular opinion so far, so I'm just going to keep that theme going here. <coughs> I'm not really an expert with WordPress. I'm not really an expert in this tool either, but I have read about some of the architecture behind Gutenberg. I would stress that I think, um, first and foremost, Gutenberg has patterns kind of inherently inside of its editor. You can pick things, say, I want to add this, this pattern here, and boom, something shows up on the left, and you have a nice little WYSIWYG, and it goes, and it's, it's an extremely useful way, I think, uh, very usable editing experience that WordPress has produced. And it, it has patterns, it just does. So, but I think the key advantage here is really the, the usability. I just want to stress that. So it's good, it's very, very, very good for that. Uh, people love it, they're very excited about this. The main disadvantage, in my opinion, is the lack of structured content. All of this stuff that's going on in this page is producing content inside of a big blob of text. I think it'll be extremely interesting to see how this responds to the test of time. The minute that you start making changes to patterns, what's going to happen to that markup that's been produced? by an editor like this inside of a big giant blob. I feel like we've been down the blob territory before, <laughs> and we in the Drupal community are like way done with that. Like we, we've felt the pain from that. So I am quite curious to see how this goes, but I will just tell you they have a beautiful editing experience that I think we should try to explore as part of the work that we're doing. And that might be something that we look into the next piece is really around web components. I think web components is the, a higher order technology that we in this space need to keep an eye on. So why? Why is this relevant? Well, web components allow you to create kind of a, a library of widgets. And these widgets are rendered as custom tags on a page, right? Uh, they're not standard HTML tags. They're their own animal, much like um, React is using some similar design patterns in its implementation. Uh, but if you think about it, these widgets kind of represent these patterns that we're talking about today, right? It's the same thing. We're just using different terminology. So if we want to extend the least responsibility principles, this might be another good one to consider, right? Because the web components and the library can sponsor all of the markup that we need for every pattern. Maybe it replaces Twig. I don't know. Maybe. Probably not. Um, but it, it will be the replacement, in my mind, for the markup because it can sit between both systems. It can be a third sponsored system that handles only the markup, all of that. Uh, the design system can consume it. The Drupal system can consume it. It doesn't need to worry about uh, you know one system owning too much of that and another. The design system, in my mind, would then control just the CSS, the visual styling, the JavaScript, the interactivity, that kind of work, the creative. Uh, and the CMS would be the thing that controls the content. Both would use this same web component-driven markup, and I think that's a really elegant way to split the responsibilities of those different parts out. So keep an eye on that. I want to thank you all very much. I had a good time for the first time giving this talk. I don't, I don't think it was horrible, but you can tell me later that it was. Thank you so much.